Cyclotron motion is a fancy, unfamiliar word that simply means making particles go in circles in a magnetic field. So cyclotron, tron, think, you know, something futuristic like magnetic fields. And cycla hopefully looks like circle to you. So just remember that that's all we're talking about. Charged particles going in circles due to magnetic fields. Now, how do we get this? So think about a scenario right? Think about one moment in, in space time. We have our velocity vector in some direction. And if our magnetic field is perpendicular to velocity, in this case into the page, then we know that our force is going to be perpendicular as well to both of those. So at some time later, it's moved a little bit. And in this case, we have a uniform magnetic field that's important for cyclotron motion. So at some position later, the velocity vector is in a new direction, but it's in the same magnetic field, which is in fact still perpendicular to that velocity vector. So we get the same magnitude force, which is still perpendicular. So what this really ends up looking like is that you have a constant force, at least constant in strength, that is always perpendicular to the velocity always perpendicular to the velocity means you're going to get circular motion. And since your force vector is going to be constant in strength, this is simply uniform circular motion. So make sure you understand the logic of where this is coming from. That as long as you're starting your charged particle with a velocity that is perpendicular to your magnetic field and your magnetic field is uniform in that region, you automatically get circles. There's nothing you have to do to the charged particle to make it go in a circle other than aim it in the right direction initially and have it actually travel perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field. So this is something that has a couple of applications and we're going to talk about those applications but it's also something interesting to calculate since it brings back all of our circular motion equations from before. So you might want to go back and review that since circular motion is frequently something people get tripped up with. Keep in mind that here we're not talking about rotational motion, we're still thinking about a point charge, so it's simply circular motion. So this is something cool in that you can literally observe it. So what this picture shows is a beam of electrons that are traveling in a circle. And they're in a gas that lights up when the electrons pass through them. So these two coils of wire out here are creating the magnetic field. And you should be able to think about the fact that that means the magnetic field is then perpendicular to these coils. This is a situation called a Hemholtz coil. So it's not quite a solenoid, but in this central region, you still have a fairly uniform ma uh, magnetic field. So you get circular motion. And this is a really neat experiment because it actually was one of the ways that you can measure the charge to mass ratio of the electron. And that's a very fundamental measurement. So going back to circular motion, what do our equations look like? So we said that our force is QV times B. Now remember there's a sine of alpha here, but as long as V and B are perpendicular, sine of 90 is simply 1. So QVB is already assuming that V is perpendicular to B. Now we can then use our circular motion equations. So we have that radial acceleration and that's MV squared over R. So this is actually coming from uniform circular motion and this is coming from just Newton's laws, right? So this is good old Newton. And so here we're really just thinking about a, a radial force. So I'm not going to go through the derivation, but you can think about then calculating the, uh, the radius that we're actually traveling. And that just actually combines this equation and this equation to solve for radius. So you get mv over qb. So if you have a constant magnetic field or a uniform magnetic field that doesn't change, this tells you and you're dealing with the same particles like electrons. That tells you that different speeds of electrons or different energies of electrons travel in different size circles. Another way to think about this is that different mass particles that all have the same speed, for instance, will actually travel in different size circles. And that's something we use for a lot of applications.
Now, something that's interesting is we can actually talk about the frequency. And remember that frequency relates to the amount of time that it takes. So we can think about frequency as one over period, which is capital T. And remember that this is an angular frequency. This is just one over T. There's no two pi here. So what we can do is simply think about the period relating to the velocity and the total distance traveled, which is two pi r right, the circumference of the circle. So you can rearrange, solve for this frequency, and you get QB over 2 pi m. So what is interesting about this is that this is independent of V. So what this means is that if we start spinning our particles around in a circle because they're in a uniform magnetic field, that the amount of time that it takes for them to complete the circle depends on their charge and their mass, it doesn't depend on how fast they're going. So the radius changes based on how fast they're going, the frequency does not. So again, depending on what you're trying to measure, you can use either time or radius to figure this out. And there are some scenarios where we use one versus the other. So, so far we've been talking about circles. And I want to briefly point out that a spiral is simply a circle plus a straight line. Now the circle is coming from the perpendicular component of, of the velocity vector and perpendicular means with respect to the magnetic field. And in this case, the straight part, the straight line is coming from a parallel component of the magnetic field. So what that means is that if you don't start your magnetic field, sorry, if you don't start your velocity vector entirely perpendicular to your uh, magnetic field, then you're actually going to get spirals. So remember that if uh, we talk about alpha, which is the angle between our velocity vector and a magnetic field, that if those are actually parallel or anti-parallel, then your particles actually travel in a straight line. There's no force whatsoever. 90 degrees, when they're perpendicular, you get circles. Anything else, you get a spiral because there's a component that is perpendicular and a component that is parallel. So in a way, spiral is the more general thing that happens, but it's harder to calculate and it's actually less interesting that normally we're going to set up a situation where they're perpendicular and we get circles. So please understand where spirals come from to see that circles are actually a special case, but in general we're going to work with the circle case. So one of the few cases where we do care about spirals is actually forming the auroras. And this is something glowing uh, you see in near the South Pole or the North Pole. I've never actually seen it, but I'm guessing it's pretty awesome. And this has to do with charged particles actually moving uh, in the atmosphere due to the magnetic fields of the Earth. Now in this case you get spirals because there's one, not a uniform magnetic field, so it's really hard to keep our charged particles always going perpendicular to the magnetic field. And there's no reason to assume that the charged particles are going to start perpendicular to the magnetic field wherever they start. So if it started exactly perpendicular, sure, you'd get circles, but again, that's one specific angle. For any other angle, if your velocity vector is oriented in a random direction, which is what you would expect for charged particles being produced uh, in our upper atmosphere, well, then you get spirals. Again, there's a portion of the velocity vector that's parallel and a portion that is perpendicular. So the auroras is electricity and magnetism in action.